guess you're going to have to be the judge of that, aren't you? Um, thank you. I'm Scott Noppy Brandon. I'm the executive director of the Institute, and it's my pleasure to welcome you today. Um, I'm going to uh, make a few words, a few comments to uh, kind of set the tone for the Institute's uh, summer session, but also with the hope that it will start a conversation with everyone about um, the many, many sides of education in the arts that we at Lincoln Center Institute believe are not only important, but very relevant to education today in the United States and well beyond the United States. Um, First, I always uh, start with what I uh, characterize as the welcome wagon approach, which I get to tell you a little bit about summer session and the larger view of it in terms of fun facts to know. This summer, we have people here um, from, we believe, 33 states in the United States, um, eight countries, uh, including, so you don't think I'm lying, Canada, Egypt, Japan, Kenya, South Korea, United Kingdom, Venezuela, and uh, though not a country um, of its own, but a distinguished member of the family of the United States, um, Puerto Rico. We thank all of you for being here. Yeah. I would also um, like to make mention that this year, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, we have 94 educators here from Puerto Rico. Um, which is extraordinary, and we thank you for um, the effort and the belief in what we do. I think this is the fifth or sixth year in a row we've had educators um, come, and it's quite an honor to uh, be with you. I've uh, started at Lincoln Center in 1987, and I always say that one of the greatest um, joys, pleasures of my job is that I have the single honor of being the person who's introduced Maxine Green uh, more than anyone else in the country. Now, um, that may sound like I'm the warm-up act, um, and I have, uh, I have in the past um, claimed that, um, which is a terrible way of putting it, but I was the Wiggles to Maxine's Barney, but um, that may be a reference that is not worth going into. Um, but what I do believe is, is that Maxine has set the tone for, for the Institute um, since she started here as a uh, person that was a co-founder key in the developing, development of the organization in the mid-70s. Um, and so if you say, well, he started in 87, she started in the mid-70s, don't these people have a life outside of this place? Can't they get rid of us? The truth is no. And, um, <laughs> Uh, so don't try. <laughs> the reason is, is that we think we're on to something. We think that we have a read on a type of teaching and learning in the arts that not only is essential and relevant, um, but is in its own way the kind of education in the arts that we think will um, help change education as we know it today um, in its many component parts. Maxine has obviously, um, over the years, been a central feature in that discussion even though many people over the years have defined her, described her as the Bob Dylan of education, which I think is pretty cool. We believe that the matter of imagination in education is one of relevance and urgency for all institutions of education. The importance of basic learning and reasonable accountability are not in question. Reasonable accountability, I might add. Yet it is also commonly agreed that something crucial is lacking in education today. Children, most specifically those in public schools, urban and rural, do not come out of their graduating classes sufficiently equipped for life in today's economic environment. By and large, they are not prepared for mid-level and leadership positions in the workforce because they are unable to envision necessary changes to the status quo in offices of industry, education, and administration. There is no spark in the sum of their acquired knowledge that would propel them toward original, innovative thinking. A recent ch panel chaired by Cyrus Driver of the Ford Foundation has presented four fundamental changes facing public education, and they are the changing global economy that demands an imaginative, innovative, and creative workforce equipped with skills that cut across traditional academic disciplines, 
embracing democracy and difference to advance and sustain pluralism as the foundation of society and civic life, mastering and capitalizing on technology as a power for transforming learning and for enabling us to give voice to and visibility to students' knowledge, aspirations, and achievements, facing up to the need for increased equity in public education in its financing in the quality of instruction and the opportunities for advancement and in the time, space, and tools to learn. Having studied the meaning and possible uses of imagination for over 30 years as part of the refinement and structuring of our learning and teaching at LCI, we are convinced its value is a primary skill that can be taught. Dick Deasy, recently retired director of the Art Education Partnership in Washington, DC, offered what is very clear in recent public opinion polling and in our own research is that people across the country want a much more engaging and broadened education for students. They want schools to help students set high standards for themselves, have ambition and aspirations for success, and develop the skills to fulfill their dreams and meet the demands of the 21st century world in which we live. In a recent survey, a majority of voters, 88%, believe that an education in and through the arts is essential to developing the capacities of the imagination that empower students to achieve these goals. Dick says, we have never seen this clear or strong an indication of public support for arts education. Voters react very strongly to the idea of combining the basics with the arts, this is important, for the cultivation of the imagination. They also feel an education in the arts makes a major contribution to participating in a group or being a team player, learning to set goals, and respecting multiple values and perspectives. Results from this poll echo findings from the current research and poll data. According to the national poll released in March 2007 by the Partnership for 21st Century Skills, a majority of survey respondents indicated that schools need to do a better job in keeping up with changing educational needs. This mirrors earlier findings released by the conference board in 2006, citing that nearly three-fourths of business leaders surveyed ranked imagination, creativity, and innovation as among the top five applied skills projected to increase in importance for future graduates. But there's a problem with it. If you go to the conference board report, it also says, we gave 155 school superintendents and 89 employers a list of 11 skills or observable behaviors, asked them to rank which ones best demonstrate imagination, creativity, and innovation. Both groups agreed that ability to identify new patterns of behavior or new combinations of actions and integration of knowledge across different disciplines are foremost in demonstrating ICI, imagination, creativity, and innovation. But employers say problem identification or articulation best describes and demonstrates ICI. Superintendents rank problem solving first. Employers rank it eighth. These discrepancies bolster the view that while schools teach students how to solve problems put before them, the business sector requires workers who can identify the problem in the first place. A very different skill set. The development and use of the imagination is not confined to a single dis discipline, nor can the content, skills, and modes of thought of a single discipline satisfy the demand to develop the other skills recent reports deem critical to the current and future workforce. Collaboration and teamwork, critical thinking, problem solving, flexibility, adaptability, and the ability to communicate in multiple forms. Integrated, interdisciplinary learning is essential to developing these skills. Competency for building capacities of the imagination rests primarily with an education in and through the arts, but incorporating imagination across the curriculum produces the best results. Now to bring it to something I think is really important, the, the artist Paul Cezanne once stated that our eyes see the front of a painting and imagination curves to the other side. Think about it for a second. Your eyes see the front of a painting, but imagination curves to the other side. What I love about the image is, is that it has multiple perspectives, multiple angles. It's a three-dimensional image, if you will. And what it's saying is, don't just rely on what we see. 
don't just rely on what we know, but rely on the as if, the what if, the what's next part of the question, the part that's not right in front of us, the part that we have to stretch to learn more about, to care more about possibly, um, to really be able to see what initially we thought was just in front of us. Maxine, over the years, has done us many, many um, uh, favors. Um, one is she publishes some incredible books like um, Releasing the Imagination which I really encourage all of you to read. If you haven't read it in many years, read it again. If you haven't had an opportunity to read it, it's an extraordinary book. In it, she says, it is imagination that opens our eyes to worlds beyond our experience, enabling us to create, care for others, and envision social change. As I said a few minutes ago, that I've had the pleasure of introducing Maxine or the Bob Dylan of education um, many, many times over the years. And I often joke, as I did, that I get to be the stand-up um, uh, first act of Maxine's show. Um, I know of no one else in education that I've had the pleasure of interacting with over the years that can take complex, diverse thoughts, actions, events, weave them together into a single story that we as both participants and as, as listeners of can sit there and know what she's, the journey she's taking us through even if we don't know every reference. And believe me, that's a skill that few, few presenters have. With that, it's my sincere pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Maxine Green. I hold it? Uh, however long uh, you've been here, uh, you'll, you'll find, as I do, uh, windows opening uh, and seeing new things, seeing new colors, uh, new significances in our lived lives. Uh, we, what happens here can't but enable you to see more, to wonder, to pose some of the existential questions that plague us all questions about what it means to be human, to extend our hands to others in a difficult time when atrocities we cannot control uh, happen, ha occur all around us, when human and natural catastrophes have eroded our sense of invulnerability. I think of the hostages held in Colombia, of what is happening in Zimbabwe, of the earthquake victims abandoned uh, to starvation in Burma, of the trafficking of women. And I somehow keep thinking back to my faith, maybe a youthful faith, in the, in, in the dignity of the human being and in each person's rights to life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And I wonder what it all means today when we see the people along the roads after earthquakes, uh, when, we, when we get the feeling of the, uh, of the kind of suffering that is lived through these days, it's not surprising that so many people turn their heads away, sublimate their sense of powerlessness, yearn after the kind of celebrity sought an American Idol or dancing with the celebrities, a celebrity that may have replaced the American dream. Some of us ask what kind of selves we hope to create, what sort of identity in the midst of the pressures of, the, of a troubled world. And some of us have stopped caring and sunk into a kind of apathy of indifference. We are well aware that we invite you to experience an aesthetic education that the Rembrandt paintings in the Metropolitan do not just by hanging there make a difference in our lives. We know that the Jerome Robbins ballets in all their splendor cannot simply when looked at 
aroused us from apathy, and there are many apathetic people who pass by the paintings and say, it's Tuesday, I've seen Rembrandt. The, uh, uh, and part of our, our obligation, and we think part of your obligation, is to enable yourselves and others to move outward toward the painting, to learn something about its qualities, to learn something about its possibilities. And what we do here, in part, is to try to free people to have participatory experiences, not simply static, staring, uh, uh, staring appearances. And as, uh, as, as Scott said, what, what is another very important thing about encounters with the arts is that they do uh, release imagination. Uh, they, they, they do make an imagination an active uh, faculty, if you like. An imagination can be fostered if we can set aside now and then our desire for answers, our hope for possession, I like th this account of imagination. It is the willingness to imagine oneself in the other person's skin, to see things as if one were momentarily at least, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, momentarily at least another, to experience how the other half lives. It is not what occurs, is this not what occurs in drama or fiction? when we are transported into another person's mind and body existing in another time and place, in another culture and society, then we experience the world as if we were Oedipus, Hamlet, Anna Karenina, but not just the world of heroes and heroines. The poetic imagination e equally empowers us to identify with the forgotten, with the discarded persons of history. It invites excluded middles back into the fold, opens the doors to prodigal sons and daughters, and refuses the condescending tolerance of the elite, <coughs> the saved toward the damned. Imagination opposes the apartheid logic of black and white. I find that so important especially important today, uh, partly because I was talking about before, partly because of the diverse children now crowding into our classrooms, children from all over, children who seem like strangers to us, like perpetual outsiders, when our obligation is to use imagination so we can it, we can bring them in so we can see through their eyes for a bit, so we can encounter works of art that they can understand. It's this kind of imagination that occurs in classrooms that can occur <clears throat> with regard to particular works. Uh, the very sharing <clears throat> of the encounter may well give rise to a community of people, each entering from his or her own location. But when I see that in these workshops, or I see it when people go together to a museum, it's not only a participation in the work of art, it's a communal participation. The dialogues we hear, the uh, sudden uh, perceptions that we see bring people together in a community of awareness that I've seen, I've seldom seen in other places. So uh, I, I, I'm hoping some of this, some of this emphasis upon the as if, some of this moving forward in terms of who we are, some of this ability to extend our hands to strangers uh, as well as our own feeling of our own experience enhanced. I hope this uh, will make a difference in these uh, in these few days we're allotting to aesthetic education. It's a matter, again, of awakening imaginative capacities and of appealing to people's freedom, which is so important. I'm sorry for my soprano voice. I might heal it over the week. For free human beings 
can choose, can move beyond where they are, can ascend to places which in their ordinariness they would have no idea. I want to end with some lines from Young Lee's Furious Virgins, versions from his book, The City in Which I Love You. I wait for shapelessness, for shapeliness, limbed or dissolution. It's paradise due or narrowly missed until another thousand years. I wait in a blue hour and far away noise of hammering and on a page, a poem begins, begun, something about to be dispersed, something about to come into being. It is turned to a possibility, as we are in this confusing time. These are, <coughs> these are blue hours for us as well. Something indeed may have begun, and thank you, and I hope it does. Now it's your turn.